train was going, stopping every few miles, picking up people from uh, mines, from ar from ammunition factories, from all other factories was slave labor. Not only Jews, everybody was slaves. They were work. work. They brought them and they put us on that. And the, those people we looked over, we, like I told you, we had enough food when we were in that first camp because I knew everybody, so he was not real. We had enough, we didn't have too much, but he had enough. Those people were scared, walking dead, every one of them. And the trains train started going, stopping every an hour or so. And you know, they dropped like flies on the train. You know what they did? They came and threw them overboard. They threw all those people overboard. By the time we got to Prague, the half of the people were gone. They threw them overboard, they died. We came to Prague, our Prague, Czechoslovakia. Our, we were lucky, our train stopped underneath our overpass. People were going to war. Over the, and now I think our car was right under the overpass. People, there was already morning, daylight, that was, you know, they were going to work. Mm -hmm. And all the people are walking on the walk, they threw whatever they had for lunch or whatever they had food, they threw through to us. They threw to our wagon. And I said to my brother, there was another two brothers with us. See, I'm not like, he, he, he made yes. He agreed. I, I usually he says not so, but this time he said. Anyway, I said to, he said to his parents, you stay in the corner, whatever I catch, I throw to you, you keep it, and so we have some food. <laughs> and that was it. I threw it to him, and maybe 10 minutes, he stood there for maybe an hour or so, maybe more. All of a sudden, a truck came in from the Red Cross. They start throwing bread, all breads to the car. Unfortunately, most of the people didn't have the strength to catch it, because most all the people they picked up from the road. All I had to do was move my arm and I catch the bread, because they were, they were fall, I, look, everybody was looking for himself. I am honest with you. No, I could talk about it. Every time I caught up and I throw it to him, the other brother does the same thing. So he wound up with, with enough bread. He was holding in the corner. From then on, you were traveling in the train for four weeks. Four weeks on the open air. And January, can you imagine how cold it was? The only water we had is licking from somebody's back the snow. <laughs> in northern Germany, traveling all the way. First we went to Austria. There was a concentration named, named Mauthausen. It was in Austria. We stopped there, they uncoupled a couple cars, and they left him. The rest of us, we started traveling again. Some cars they left, and me and him were on the car, they, we started traveling again. You we went to Berlin. They made us lay down so we don't see the ruins. Every time we came to our city, we had to lay down because they didn't let us see the ruins where the bombs fell. One, <laughs> one time, I came, we came to a star, a stop, I forgot the name of the city already. I, besides that, I would know. There was a guard sitting always on each car on top. <laughs> I had the old watch. What I found, I found it, it wasn't mine because they took mine away. I, all, I don't know, it wasn't, I know it was even running. I said to the, to the Yes, there was a regular SS guy, not a regular guy. I said to him, I'll give you a watch, bring me some bread. So he looked at him, oh, I like that watch. I'll bring you some bread. He went down, he never, I never saw him before anymore. <laughs> I never saw him anymore. So what I did, I said, the heck with you. At least I got rid of him from the car. I went down from the car. The locomotive, you know, the old-fashioned locomotive was a couple cars in front of me. I went down, took my path, and I, op I went to the locomotive, I opened a, a top, spigot, spigot. a spigot, and I filled up with water, mm -hmm. and I went to the car, we had water and bread to eat. That's what I said. And what saved us? The clothes we had. Because it was so cold, we, we were very well dressed. Anyway, after a while, you wound up in another camp. After three or four weeks, you wound up in Buchenwald, another concentration camp. 
they manufactured the Messerschmitt, the airplanes. And that, in that, in the Buchenwald camp, there was factory of Messerschmitt. They put us in a hangar. We had to sleep on the floor. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we lay on the floor. Sue comes over to me, a young guy who went to school with me too. He was there. He was a son of a dog catcher in my town. He was the son. I ever had nothing to do with him. I knew him from my hometown, but I had nothing to do with him. He says, "What are you doing here?" He says, they they caught me. They put me here too. He wasn't Jewish. <laughs> anyway. We were the two days living on the floor. Then they brought another train. They loaded us up on another train, still open, and yet we traveled again. Finally, we wound up in the Tyrolean mountains, a camp of Camp Flossenburg, <laughs> and uh, we were in that camp uh, maybe a week or so. We had to go to the bathroom. We had to open the door. There was a tower right in front. We had to yell our number, and then put the spotlight on everybody who looked up. Otherwise, they shoot you. Call my name. The flag, the spotlight was when we go to the uh, latrine. Anyway, that took up about two weeks. Two weeks later, they lined us up again, and they took us to a shower. They took us to a shower room. The shower room was a was a guest chamber. And what they did, <coughs> we had to undress. We were, they took our uniforms, our heavy clothes away. We were naked in that room. The officer was standing in front of that room of that uh, guest shower chamber, room. shower room, whatever they call it. You go here, you, middle of that room was a rope, right in the center. And they start picking. You go on this side, you go on this side, you go, you know, that's how your selection. They put him on the other side, they put me on that side. Everything, every time it happened like that. And I go, I am in there, all of us, maybe 150 of us. And I look at those people, I still the same thing, you know, after so many years' experience, what I went through, I can recognize what's going on. I looked at the tracks. I see. I, I'm worried about those people because they don't look right to me. So how can I get him back? So I waved to him. I looked at the SS card. I said, when he looked out of the way, I waved to him, to my brother, to come over to the ropes. He did come over to the ropes. And I waited until the SS officer looked out of the way. I sneaked under the rope, grabbed his arm, put him to my side. I pulled him over the ropes. In the head rope, they will all have black marks on the head. They marked them with black crayon or whatever it was. First thing, I cleaned this up for him, and I kept him with me. Maybe ten minutes later, they took all those people on the other side out. We never seen them again. They took them out. We, after that, they took us out after the shower, and we had to run naked, maybe three or four barracks down in snow to a room, they give you a pair of pants, stripes, pair of, a jacket, stripes, a head stripes, and a pair of sandals. Oh. That's what they gave us, the snow. And they put us on another train. <laughs> See, this, I was sick of trains already. <laughs> anyway, the train took, didn't take long, maybe it took a half hour drive in the train. We wound up on an airport, an army as also Henkelwerke, also maker of airplanes. I don't know what kind of Henkel, uh, Messerschmitt or whatever. They manufacture planes. And they put us in a building which had no doors, no windows, because either was bombed out or they didn't finish it. We had to go up to the building. We had to go on, on a board. On a plank. On a plank to go out. Uh, and their bunks, bunks were in there. That's where they put us in. And that's where we stood. Every day we had to go down and walk to the airport, the airfield, which was maybe half a mile away. We didn't have any food. I swear, we had to eat grass. Grass, we grabbed grass. There were some French people with us. You know what they did? They dug in the grass and they found snails and they ate them. They ate those snails. I couldn't do it. I'd rather drop it than eat it. So we ate grass. He ate the grass, I ate the grass. 
We went to the airport. Every two hours, American bombers came and dropped bombs on the on the airfields. Every every time the siren ran, we had to run over. They chased us over the runways. So we couldn't hide. There was nowhere to hide. We just were off the runway. They didn't drop bombs on us. They dropped on the runways. They dropped on the hangars. Every two hours. And we had to go and fix the holes because they were those desperately trying to get their planes up. They couldn't do it. And that took three months. One day, a bomb fell down maybe 100 feet from us. It was such dust because that bomb fell, fell close to us. I grabbed his hand. I said, Bernie, now is the time to run. I don't know where we're going to run. We went to the forest. It was a small forest. I said, let wherever you are, up, I don't care anymore. And we wound up, not, not a big forest, maybe 15, 20 minutes. On the other side of the forest, I see a farmhouse. And you know where they used to keep potatoes for the winter? Mm -hmm. They built, uh, they made from dirt. They put potatoes, they cover them with dirt for the winter. Beets, potatoes. Beets, potatoes, stuff like that. And all of a sudden we see a line of them. So I said, oh, now we got potatoes. Let's get to it. So we got to it, guess what happened? On the other side of the potato patch, two SS officers got up with guns. They were hiding from the bombs too. But they were hiding in the same place as we did. They took us back. They took us back. Good thing they didn't They could have shot us. They took us back to the camp. But it was for three months, we couldn't fix it anymore. There were so many holes. Every two hours, planes came. They couldn't take, they couldn't take off. The planes were ruined, the hangars. They decided to take us out of there. The SS left, and then the set of the SS, maybe 150 of us were left? 150, that's about it. They took us out, the SS left already. They brought old men. I know I was, we were young. I thought they were, they were very old. I think there were 60, 70 year old Air Force men, Air Force guys. And they, maybe a few of them came. They says, but the SS was gone. And they guarded us, and we started walking. One of the SS guys was so old, he gave him his rifle to call him. Carry my rifle because it's too heavy yeah. for me. It's not funny, but <laughs> that's how it was. We walked on the road towards Dachau. They told us we're going to Dachau. We walked maybe one or two days. One, one day was evening, and one of the guards says there was only two, two, two guards, two ex-Air Force people, I don't know. What. They said to us, let's go down the hill. Maybe I, they were hungry, they had not to eat either. There's a farm, maybe I can get to the farm. Let's ride up, make a fire. I get some potatoes, we eat something. Sure enough, he went down to the farm, one of them. He brought up a whole bunch of potatoes. We lit the fire, we had some potatoes, burn, we cooked some potatoes. The problem was they didn't put the fire out. And on the road next to the road, a truck passes by with SS guards, and they saw the fire, and they came down. And they took all of us, they, including the, the guards, they put us on the truck and they drove us to Dachau. We wound up in Dachau. <laughs> but at least we were not hungry, we ate some potatoes. We went in Dachau, the head, there was no room where to stay. The barracks were full. You, had, you couldn't put a needle in the, in the bunk. So me and him, there was plenty of blankets because people were dropping like flies. So you could blanket you with a million of them. We took blankets, him and me, and we laid down in front of the one of the barracks. Not only us, a lot of other people did. He would stay there. And we didn't know we had typhus at that time. We had no idea. We were sick. We were laying there, rain, and rain, and whatever, we were still there. We didn't eat anything. All of a sudden, everybody started running. The army is, the American army is here. So people started, we couldn't run, we were sick, but we didn't even know about it. It's a miracle. I was seven years in camp, I wasn't sick one day. 
And that's the last days. We had time for more of us. And people start running to the fences. And the fences were electrified. They were hanging on the fences. They were de dying on the fences. Uh, anyway, an ambulance came in, an army ambulance, and they picked me up from the lane there. They picked me up. With my, I says, how about him? I couldn't speak English. My brother, you know, in uh -huh. German, I said, brother. Uh -huh. So he looked at me, the guy says, okay, let him, I'll take him too. So both of us, they took both of us, they put us at the army hospital. And it came was a big army hospital. And that's where he was. <coughs> before that, before that, before they took us up, everybody got a can of meat. They opened the warehouses there, and they found German cans of meat, what they had for the army or whatever they had. And everybody had a can in front of them. We were laying outside to put a can of everybody. We couldn't even open the can. We were sick. So we didn't touch it. A lot of people opened it up somehow, and they ate it. As soon as they ate it, hundreds of people were dying every day because they had too much food and same. A can of meat at once, they killed them. Hundreds of people had... They carried them out, they were laying on the ground. Fortunately, we couldn't eat, so we, we were all right. They picked us up and they put us in the army hospital because they saw the can was right in front of us. We didn't eat it. We were in the hospital three months, in the army hospital. After three months, one of our friends was with us in, in the camp, in the hospital. He was an elderly guy, elder guy. not old, but he was el older than us. They're looking for translators to translate from German to English. He knew a little English, so he volunteered to go. We didn't know, he didn't know where he was going. They put him in a camp, in the, within the camp, in a camp where they kept army prisoners of war, German army prisoners of war. He was the translator in that camp. German soldiers. And he was coming every night, he was coming back to the hospital. And one day he's telling us he recognized somebody, he knew somebody, but he didn't know exactly who it was. Finally, the second day, he reminded himself it was the commandant of the camp in Poishev. He had army uniform instead of SS. That's how he got away. So he went to the guards, and he told them, Look, I, don't, I know what the guy is. He's wearing an army, he's not an army man. He's an officer, high rank officer, I guess. He's the commandant of a camp, of our camp. So naturally, the guard went to higher officers, I don't know, that was how high rank, chain, uh, uh, how do you call it, chain, chain, chain of command. Chain of command. command. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, officers came and they took him out, and he squealed on three other ones, who were also in army uniform, who were SS officers. They took him away. He came out and back. He told him, I recognize him. So we still weren't human. That was right in the beginning. We found out from the hospital, from the nurses and the uh, uh, doctors in the, the hospital, they took those guys, they shipped them to Poland. And two days later, we found out they took him to the camp where they were coming out and they hanged him in the Vlada court. They hanged all of them. Uh, well, this is a minor thing. After three months in that camp, we were already healthy. You know, you know, we weren't, we weren't uh, stronger, but we were all right. They put us in a truck. I never forget. A tr army truck, but friend, the driver he was a Frenchman. You know, that a French zone, American zone. It was a I never forget him. They put us under, they drove us to a Bavarian uh, resort town. There was a beautiful lake and ma villas all around the lake, beautiful villas. And in, in, in the valley, there was buildings where they kept Hitler Jugend. They trained them for the BSS. They empty and they gave us, like I told you before, they got us yellow pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they gave us. After a while, I told you, the army said, made a commission and I was elected and I was getting paid an office to distribute clothes. And that's where I was all the time. 
and people used to come to me and I gave them what they needed. I had that file and people worked and, and that's what my job was. I was sitting on a bench and two nuns came over. My train was leaving in the morning and they said to me, no, you're going to sleep here? I said, yeah, but my train is gone tomorrow. No, no, you're not going to sleep here, you come with us. I told them, they took me to the closet, they fed me, and they gave me a room to sleep, and I took a shower, and I shaved. They brought me the next day to the train, and I went back on the train. They, I thanked them very much. I had nothing to give them, but I didn't want anything. And on the train, every stop the train makes, Russian soldiers came, papers, papers. I told you the men on the other side had papers for me that I'm a uh, Czech citizen. Mm -hmm. I showed the soldiers the papers. I swear they didn't know what they looked at. They didn't, couldn't even read. Soon they saw, Papi, you have the cold rush, Papiere, Papiere. That's all. They looked at, I had a paper, they didn't even look at them. They left me alone. And that's the way every station they came in, they checked, and they didn't bother me. Finally, I wound up in prison. In prison, I got out of the train, and I start. I found a parallel road with the tracks. I didn't want to go on the tracks because I know they're going to be uh, border guards. I'm walking on the road with, in snow, and I had a knapsack. In the knapsack, I had all kinds of stuff, shaving stuff, you know, stuff like that. And I had two bottles of vodka. I, that I always carry that because with the rushes, you never know what you needed. <laughs> <laughs> See, with me, I don't want to pray. I always talk ahead. I thought I had it. I'm walking on that road, and all of a sudden, a Russian soldiers come over. Come over to me. Where are you going? So I told them I'm going to look for a job in some town. I told them my name was a town. I had everything prepared. Oh, oh yeah, come, I'll walk with you. He walked in the bottom of me. Finally, we talked and talked. I took a bottle. I was sick of him already. I took a bottle of vodka. He let's have a let's have a drink. <laughs> he saw that drink. He, he was happier guy than ever. He started drinking. I may believe I drink. He was loaded. He <laughs> finished the whole bottle. And I, I, I may believe I drink. You know, he was so he didn't even pay attention. We came to a crossroad. We walked, I don't know how long we walked. I don't pay it was middle of the night. He said to me, there was a cross a crossroad. One road went this one. He says, come to me to my barracks around the corner. You stay there overnight. Tomorrow you can go where you go. And he tells me. He was a nice guy. I said, no, no, no. I'm going my way. You go your way. And sure enough, he was drunk enough, so you went. And I went my way. <laughs> it's, it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. I went back to the tracks, and I started walking on the tracks again. All of a sudden, I see a light, a boot with lights in it on the tracks, on the side of the tracks. Oh, I see, this is the border guard, must be close to the border. So I, I couldn't go there because they would stop me. I went back to the forest, I circled around, and I came out on the other side of them, quite a few ways away. And I started walking still on the same tracks. And I, I didn't know even, I was in Germany already. I didn't know. And I found there was wilderness. I saw, I, I was dirty, filthy, you know, so many days. <laughs> there was a brook, I'll never forget, there was a brook uh, running down. I don't know why, it didn't freeze. It was running water, but I cold. I washed myself, I shaved myself with cold water. In the wilderness, nobody there. And I, and I got myself decent looking, and I started walking on the, again on the tracks. I walked, and all of a sudden, I came to a highway. I came to a highway, and I know I was in Germany already. I came to a highway, I said, once I find a highway, I can go to the next station and get somewhere. I had with me papers from Dachau, from the command of the army. Uh, I, I, I still have the paper. From the army was liberated Dachau. There I was liberated in that camp. Wow. I had papers. So I walked, the other papers I had, that I was a, a Czech citizen, I had, I only showed them to the Russians, nobody else. I walked and I found, I, got to, I came to a highway, I started walking on the highway, two German policemen come over. German policemen. 
What do you do in this restricted area? You can be here. It's a, it's a border, border area. What are you doing here? I don't no, know what to say. I said, I was liberated in Dachau. I took the papers out from Dachau. From, from the command of the army, I showed them that. Oh, they read it. They, they, read, they know what they read. He said, oh, we see. I tell you what we can do for you. I, where are you going? I said, I'm going back to Poland. I want to go back to my hometown. Oh, my God. You know what they said to me? We bring you to the next station. There is a transport going to Poland. You have to understand, he had just come back from Poland. Right, and so he doesn't want to go back. They tried to do me a favor. They're like, I talk, I talk a lot. Oh. I talked I talk to him so many times. They got sick of me. Okay. And they said to me, I said, you're working here. You're busy. I'll find my place. So I said, go. And they let me go. And sure enough, I went to the next station. And I took a train. And I went to Munich. There was, the town was Regensburg. From there I took a train to Munich. From Munich I took another train to my camp. Rabbi. And I went back to the camp and I got my, my job in the office. I was working in the office, still in the office. And I was distributing for everybody, no me you know, I took The picture maybe I show you, I was well dressed because you know, I was I, For me I took clothes already. And that was by 19... <coughs> 1945, yeah. 45. 19. End of 45. End of 1945. 